So thank you for coming to this month's presentation of Drop by Drop. We're going to discuss rainwater harvesting today. So just some general housekeeping items. Uh, you can bring your lunch. As you probably saw, we have fruit on the back table over there. So if you'd like to help yourself, please do. Uh, please silence your cell phones so they do not interrupt the presentation. We are also videotaping this presentation, so don't be shy about it. It's in the back, and we post this on our website. So if you want to look at previous presentations that you may have missed, you can go to www.pressgetwater.com. It's also on the bottom of that fact sheet if you forget it. And you can see the previous presentations from this year. The purpose of Water Smart Drop by Drop is a public education initiative that we, the city of Prescott has taken. And so we want to start at the basics and move our way up through different water conservation and water resource management ideas. Uh, as you know, you should have received a fact sheet as you walked in. There's extra ones on the table in the back if you do not have it. Uh, we will present for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then we will take questions at the end. Since this is kind of a technical topic of rainwater harvesting, if you have specific questions during the presentation, don't be afraid to raise your hand so we can talk about it then. And then at the end, at the very end, about the last 10 minutes, we'll do a dispersed Q&A. So you have a lot of City of Prescott employees and Prescott College employees here, so if you have a specific question for one of us, don't be afraid to ask us after. Upcoming topics. So as you can see, today is June 19th with rainwater harvesting. We also have the City of Prescott Water Management coming up on July 17th and groundwater on August 21st. So if you are interested in those presentations, please attend. And a fact sheet summary for today. So there's two types of rainwater harvesting. We hear a lot about active rainwater harvesting in this community, but there's also passive rainwater harvesting, which Nick will discuss today. Um, by doing rainwater harvesting, you reduce the reliance on potable supplies, and it has a lot of other environmental benefits as well. And with the desert weather patterns, a lot of rainwater can actually be captured here. So I'd like to pass the presentation off to Nick. He is the Prescott College groundskeeper and a graduate student, and he is more versed in rainwater harvesting than I am. Thank you, Leah. Fabulous. Well, thank you all for coming today. I'm really excited. Thank you, Leah, for giving me the opportunity to present this presentation. Um, again, it says Nick Balick or Nicholas Balick, whichever you prefer. Um, I've been around Prescott College for probably about five years now. Um, done a multitude of different active and passive uh, rainwater harvesting on the campus um, and also incorporated levels of that into my undergraduate and my growing uh, graduate degree as well. So we're going to be starting off with... Uh, Okay, so uh, you all received some fact sheets, some information about kind of the presentation today. Um, I'm gonna kind of just go over that a little bit and then we'll dive deeper into it. Um, so just a little background. So Prescott, as you all probably know in one way or another, is a phenomenal place when it comes to ecology. Um, there's about five different biomes that all kind of converge in this one spot. And um, what that allows is for more biodiversity, more ecological functions that have been present here for a long time. And uh, the indigenous people who have thrived in the Southwest um, many, many years before, uh, before uh, Europeans came over here and, and uh, kind of implemented a lot of different infrastructure means. Um, there were practices surrounding rainwater harvesting that optimized uh, agriculture, landscaping, uh, drinking water, and these practices can still be utilized today. There's just a little bit of a challenge because we have these different uh, urbanized infrastructure challenges around that. Um, in, let's say, uh, what was it? It was about 15, uh, 1200, 1200, um, 1200 uh, AD, the Zuni tribe near kind of northern, northeastern Arizona and New Mexico, um, they were phenomenal when it came to rainwater harvesting and they optimized passive methods. Um, back then they didn't really have cisterns, they had to optimize monsoon seasons and kind of redirect water in ways to meet their needs. And what they actually did, they had about um, a couple hundred plots all throughout the Southwest 
And in these little plots, they would actually create little rock gabions, little rock dams, and it would slow the water down during monsoon season and kind of pool up in a way. And they would put uh, squash, beans, corn, and the types of, these types of vegetables and fruits that they planted um, were accustomed and adapted to the Southwest. They could uh, manage to produce a full stock of corn on one monsoon season, which was pretty amazing. And they were able to optimize the certain resources around them. And through these hundred different plots or so, they would, after monsoon season, go to them and it'd be kind of hit or miss. They'd either have corn or they wouldn't. They'd either have beans or they wouldn't, or they have a multitude. And we can still utilize those same methods today. Um, and fast forward to kind of modern times. Living here in Prescott, um, there's been a lot of development over the years. Um, but through that development, we've done a very uh, solid job when it comes to maintaining uh, many aspects when it comes to creek, creek pathways for our wildlife. Um, we still have pretty solid canopies within our riparian corridors. Um, as you all probably know, Prescott has very different colorful history when it comes through anthropogenic changes on our landscape, um, through mining and logging. Um, and we've kind of learned from those mistakes and have tried to reintroduce other processes in, in our own backyards. So in 2012, there was something called the Watershed Improvement Plan. And it came out, it's been published, you can access it. And it, one of the big takeaways from that was the overarching analysis of our hardscapes. So a hardscape is pretty much any hard surface that doesn't allow water to permeate through. So cement, asphalt, um, rooftops, buildings, other things. Um, and what happens, that's changed the landscape in a way where because that water's not permeating through where it used to, uh, certain areas where springs used to be are drying up and the water kind of flashes off the landscape, giving it different um, dimensions to change different corridors. And one of the things that we can start doing is trying to reintroduce more permeation into our own homes, into our, our um, infrastructure. Um, about From the watershed improvement plan, the number was about 18.5% of our overarching city limit property is hardscape. And that's a large amount of surface area that water isn't permeating through. So that changes our water cycle, it changes a multitude of things that we're gonna dive into a little bit deeper today. And through this infrastructure, there's a reason for it. Um, anyone has, has anyone ever seen like a puddle of water in cement and after two, three seasons, it starts crumbling up? It's pretty common. So water is a very destructive force. Uh, and it's a beautiful uh, elixir of life as well. So we have to be able to work with it. And a lot of our infrastructure has been designed in a way to force that water off of our landscape. Um, we want it to go into the storm drain um, and off into uh, the water treatment area. Um, we want it off our roots, off our roofs, um, into the street and away. And that's how a lot of infrastructure is designed. Well, I'm trying to instill in you maybe a different approach. Maybe we don't need to get that water off our landscape as quickly as we want, as, as need be. And what we've seen through this development is something that amongst the landscaping community, we like to call them uh, moonscapes. You might have seen these before. These are some examples of different yards, uh, front backyards um, in and around the Southwest. And what you normally see, you see gravel in different ways. You know, there's got a little movement here and some white gravel and some larger chunks of pebbles and, and other things. And what you have with gravel is it essentially, it's a rock, it's a stone that radiates more heat and ultimately makes it harder for other ecological processes to be present. Um, it doesn't look bad. Um, to some, this is beautiful. This is exactly what they want and that's totally fine. Um, I'm just, encouraging you to think a little bit differently. When I see these, I see missed opportunity. Um, you can still have drip systems and that's great and we'll, I'm sure that'll be talked about in other means through the drop by drop if it hasn't already. Um, and, that's, and that's fine, you know, these things do help with certain property values, I get that. But again, if we're trying to really instill 
a more holistic approach to managing levels of our watershed and trying to work within um, our own rainwater that's hitting our roofs, we can do a little bit different. We can do a little bit better. And it's something that, um, again, is gaining more traction called living scapes. So instead of moonscapes, you can have a living scape. And uh, all that really does, um, in order to achieve kind of from this section to this section, is just a redirection of water. That's really all it takes. And what you see here, this is a picture of on the Prescott College campus, um, looking at our, our main administration building and, and the chapel. Um, we have a parking lot over here, and this is uh, our welcome center parking lot, and it's been designed in a way where it's similar, uh, it kind of channels all the water to this one little overflow basin. And this water then gets slowed down and then is captured. It allows it to slowly per, uh, percolate through, as we talked about the hardscapes, not allowing that water to go through. Well, now we've slowed the water down, now the water is able to percolate through, kind of recharge our aquifer a little bit more, and we've surround this basin with a bunch of native uh, plants, trees, and shrubs. We have a, a juniper over here, a pinion, um, tons of uh, little grasses and wildflowers all around this area, and a majority of it isn't on irrigation. It's all fed through storm, uh, storm runoff. So that's pretty neat, um, and this is something that we're trying to do more of. I don't know if many of you have ever been to the Prescott College campus. I highly implore you to check it out, especially this time of year, because wildflowers are everywhere, butterflies are everywhere, and lizard friends are also everywhere as well. And um, it's, it's a joy walking around campus. Just you feel like, wow, I'm only two blocks away from downtown, but it feels like a completely different environment. Um, so how do we work towards living landscapes? Well, let's take a step back and ask ourselves a question. Um, look at this photo and tell me what you see. We can do Red Robin if anyone has any thoughts, but just, or just think about it. What, what is it that you see? Trees. I see some trees. <laughs> so these are aspen trees up at Lockett Meadow. Um, took this a couple years ago during the fall season. Um, beautiful up there if you haven't got a chance. So we, we see some trees. We might see... Uh, Wildlife habitat, we might see oxygen providers, we might see carbon sequesters, uh, shade providers. Um, we might even see a natural resource. Uh, some might see timber. Uh, if you have a tree in your home, in your front yard, you're probably gonna say it's uh, labor intensive, it's a nuisance. All these things. Well, I want you to look at these as one other thing, and that's a sponge. In the Southwest, anytime you see a Southwestern plant, some type of vegetation out here that's native, I want you to look at it as a little tiny water storage tank. So let's dive into that. What does that mean? Well, here's a quick depiction of the water cycle. I'm not gonna go too heavy into it, but just to give you some understanding on what I mean more about this idea of a sponge. So we had this phenomenal uh, snow season this past year. Um, I mean, I haven't seen that much snow in quite a few years. It was, it was pretty crazy. I think over, a lot of people were saying about 20 years. They haven't seen that amount of snow in about 20 years or so. I mean, it was, it was pretty incredible. Um, and what happens in the mountains, normally you get snowpack, some type of ice that then slowly melts through and then kind of percolates through the landscape and then recharges our aquifers and then you know, as it's kind of percolating through, it might hit a rock shelf and then pop out as a spring and kind of fill some streams and lakes. Um, and then through this water movement, we have vegetation. And vegetation has uh, root structures that, whether you're a tree, you probably have a tap root going down 25, 30 feet. Um, if you're a shrub, maybe spread out a little bit, maybe go down a couple, couple feet. Um, wildflower, maybe a couple inches. So there's these different layers where water's moving through uh, the shelf, and vegetation pulls that water up um, through a process that's known as evapotranspiration, and essentially a leaf on a plant, um, at, it gives off moisture through its vascular system, and the movement of this moisture allows um, the tree to then provide um, moisture to its fruit, to its flowers, and then it can continue to grow. And once it gets off the specks of kind of the leaves, that moisture then goes into the atmosphere and then condenses and then we get more storms. 
And essentially with the water cycle, uh, whenever there's been examples of deforestation, the water cycle gets affected. When you have less vegetation that's actually evapotranspiring, you're ultimately lessening your overall uh, water portfolio, in a sense. You're, if you look at a plant as a sponge, as a water tank, and you're removing those plants, you thus have less water in your, in your watershed. Now, some people be like, okay, well, I have this tree and I water it all the time. Isn't that taking up more water than, than it's giving off? It depends if it's native or non-native, if it's an ornamental or, or not. And these are conversations we need to continue to have. But this is kind of the point I'm getting at, is through the water cycle, uh, you should look at vegetation as a giant sponge. And if we can also shift that idea of a sponge in our landscape, it might be easier to connect it to an actual cistern. So today we're talking about active and passive rainwater harvesting. I've got uh, a couple slides after this that will talk more about in depth on the difference between active and passive and how you can kind of utilize it at your own homes and your own communities. So if a cistern is also a sponge, then we're kind of connecting the dots a little bit more. So after this, we have active and passive. So many of us have probably heard of active, that's the one with cisterns. Um, and then the new kind of thing, again, it's not too new, it's been utilized for thousands of years, but we're starting to implement it more in our own landscaping um, is passive rainwater harvesting. So uh, are there any immediate questions before I dive into these? All right, cool. So again, these are on the Prescott College campus. Uh, we've probably, again, have seen active in different forms. Um, this is a cistern on the backside of our dorms. Um, massive cistern. It's just under about 2,000 gallons, and it essentially feeds these garden beds and then some other surrounding landscape as well. Um, and one of the big pros of, of active rainwater harvesting is, okay, I've got this cistern. It's full. That means you have active water. You have water that you can utilize and you get to choose how, it gets, how, it's, how it's used. Um, another thing with active cisterns is Prescott has something phenomenal, which is a collaborative effort with the Water Smart Rebate Program. And you can actually get funds back through your utility bills. If you have rainwater systems, you can actually get a rebate back um, to also, one, a, a help with the assistance of paying for your own cistern, um, and then also kind of contributing to our community as a whole. Um, active also gives you the possibility of zero scaping. So zero scaping is this idea of planting vegetation that again is native to your landscape and you don't really have to plug in um, drip irrigation. It can kind of, your vegetation can thrive off of the native um, regular precipitation events. Um, where active can come in if you see a, uh, any of your plants that might be struggling, you can just give it that extra water boost and you're not pulling more potable water out. You can just utilize the rain that, you, that you've captured. Uh, rainwater harvesting as well, as water, how rain works is as, wa as the gas condenses, uh, those water molecules collect themselves around. The only way they can fall is they have to collect themselves around a particle of some sort that's in the atmosphere. And that's how rain falls. And when that occurs, it brings down different uh, minerals, different, uh, it changes kind of the chemistry of soils and it assists. Rainwater is nor normally, unless it's acid rain, uh, is normally better for your plants than potable water. Potable water has to go through filtration, sometimes chlorine, other things. Rainwater has much more, uh, has higher benefits for your overarching plants than just potable water. Uh, and then lastly, ideal for gardening. So if you have a raised bed or let's say a quarter or an eighth of an acre of your property that you're utilizing for gardening, again, you can capture rainwater and then optimize it on your, on your landscape. And because it's active, you control how it gets moved. And that's a, that's a big thing. Um, now for a couple cons. So these cisterns aren't cheap. Um, you can get maybe a 50 gallon barrel, but in all reality, you get one rainstorm. One 
small section of your roof, not even your whole roof, just one small section, maybe five by five, six by six, would fill up that 50 gallon container in a one inch rainstorm. So 50 gallons, they're helpful, but they're really not, by the time it gets filled up, then you have excess water that's pouring out of them. Um, you either need quite a few of those 50 gallon containers to kind of equate to 200 or, or 300, um, or you can get larger cisterns, uh, and the larger cistern, if it's over four feet tall, more likely you're gonna have to get some type of city permit. Um, it has to be three feet away from your house. There's certain codes you have to abide by when in trying to install some of these cisterns. So there are some challenges there. Still doable, still highly encourage them. Um, and we have six different cisterns on our Prescott College campus. Two of them are almost identical. They look, they look identical, but the reality is a cistern is a lot like a microwave. They're all different. They all take different, um, they all function the same way in the same principle, but you're gonna have different levels of maintenance. You're gonna have leaks, you're gonna have um, challenges that weather away at it, and you have to be able to maintain them. Um, which again, isn't too challenging, it's just it's those extra steps you might not think about. Um, and then last thing, they do take up medium, uh, medium to large area if needed, the larger uh, cisterns that you have. So those are kind of the pros and cons, um, but overall, cisterns, if done appropriately and done professionally, they, they do increase your property value. They do allow um, a multitude of benefits for your landscaping. And ultimately, you're going to be saving money down the, uh, down the road with uh, optimizing your water use. So that's active. Are there any immediate questions on active? All right. So now we're going to go to passive. So passive is again this idea of redirecting rainwater from your roof or from any area, any specific area and putting it in a place where it can be utilized. So one of the things that you'll notice when and if you ever visit the Preston College campus and in other parts of the city as well, um, you're gonna see something that's like wood chips spread everywhere. Uh, that's mulch. And it's a phenomenal, I, I absolutely love mulch. If, uh, I think the city has a very generous code of you can only have mulch up to three feet. Um, I put three feet of mulch on my property any day. Uh, we do it all over campus and essentially it creates this large amount of biomass that then as it rains, the water percolates through, it kind of breaks up that biomass and creates some rhizomes. Um, and what rhizomes do is they allow plants to they break down the dense molecules from pollution and other things and they allow plants to take up nitrogen, phosphorus, um, carbon, and it allows plants to grow. And we have, we need to do probably another three, five, 60 different loads of mulch on our campus because it's, it's that time of year, but we put mulch everywhere on campus. And then we put a wildflower seed mix and you never have to water it. And again, you walk on the campus this year, there's wildflowers everywhere. There's bristle cone, there's Mexican hat, there's, um, there's California poppies, it's beautiful. And you don't have to do anything. You just lay the mulch down, spray the seed, pull out some of the uh, invasive weeds and you're good to go. Um, it's pretty, pretty incredible. <laughs> and then um, these are the college dorms. These are just a section of them. And this is what's known as A block right here, and A block is one of the dorms that doesn't have any active rainwater harvesting, they only have passive. So all the rainwater here actually pours off, there's a basin inside these fences, and then there's a culvert, when those basins fill up, they actually come out um, over here, and then they fill up additional basins. And what we've done, we've uh, planted some various uh, vegetation around it, we've had currants, which is a native uh, fruit producing shrub here in the, the Central Highlands. Uh, we've got black, gold, red, and they're starting to bloom right now. And I can't wait to make some jam in another, another month or so. Um, and we're slowing the water down. This water actually comes in. There's a road just off the side over here that's known as, um, what is it? The, I'm drawing a blank. Is it Willow Street? That's it. Willow Street is actually right over here and it's a large slant. 
So most of the rain that hits that during monsoon season, we've actually directed some of that excess water that would normally pour off and go off into the creek, kind of more closer your direction. Uh, we've, we're slowing it down and then we're utilizing it on our landscape. Um, as you can see, there's some mushrooms over here, some fungi. Uh, the nice thing about passive as well is if you're, if you're orchestrating larger amounts of native plants, which you're probably gonna do when you do passive, when you do active, you're, morally, you're probably thinking gardening. When you do passive, you're pretty much your only option is for landscaping. And um, you can do it for gardening, but it's much different. Uh, passive, you can utilize for if you have herbs, if you have lavender or rosemary, um, those are great, you can utilize for passive. But other than that, you're probably gonna want a mixture of native plants. And when you do that, then you get increased wildlife. Uh, you create habitat for native birds and lizards and, and other, other organisms to live out here. And then um, again, when you do that, you'll increase wildflowers that will pop up and then you have more opportunity for the pollinators to um, kind of safely uh, consume and, and pollinate without um, spraying your, your, lard, your yard with a bunch of Roundup or other things. Uh, the beauty of passive is you kind of just, you set it and you leave it. And um, one of the big pros of it is the cost is super minimal. You have a shovel, you have some foresight, you have an idea of where your water's moving, you can do passive. Um, it's very easy to do if done with just a little bit of thought. And super easy to maintain. The biggest maintenance thing is after the first couple times of making a basin, you're probably gonna get a rainstorm and it's gonna fill up like that. And what'll happen, you're gonna have some scouring, you're gonna have to observe how the water's moving. And that's probably the biggest thing. A passive takes time to well establish. Uh, the basins that we have on campus and every building on the Preston College campus has at least one or two forms of passive uh, rainwater harvesting. We've directed our rainwater to go into some type of basin where we have native, uh, native plants and native, native vegetation. And sometimes they overflow. You get some massive rain events, sometimes they kind of scour in ways where they're going in other directions. And you have to be wary of that. Um, you don't want to create a basin right next to your foundation and then it overflows and now you're directing all this water to the foundation of your home. You want to be careful of that. And it takes a little bit of just kind of, you'll do a small indentation, see how it works. And then when you get a massive storm, you know, sometimes it's fun. You got to get your rain boots on, your rain gear, get out there and um, look at it. See how the water's moving. Uh, you'll be amazed at what you'll notice. And then again, um, it takes minimum, a uh, small to mid, mid amount of area. It doesn't take as much as a cistern does. Uh, there is zero scaping possibilities. We do have, um, I think about 25% of our passive basins on the Preston College campus have zero irrigation involved, zero drip irrigation. Um, and many of our plants are almost getting to the point where they're, they're established themselves, where we can take them off the irrigation as well, which is pretty exciting. Um, so now for some of the cons. So if you're doing passive, uh, again, you probably won't be able to have a garden um, unless you find a really cool kind of native, well-adapted seed of some sort that does well in dry, arid climates, but also can handle winter storms. It's, it's a hard, hard thing to find. Um, but again, you could do, you could do different herbs uh, in passive. Um, you're not, you have less available active water. So once the water's gone, it's gone. Uh, a lot of people might look at this and they might question, what about mosquitoes? What about insects? What about bugs? Well, the nice thing about if you design your basin appropriately, it'll probably, this basin itself was fully emptied in about five to six days. And the water was moving. Um, it, we didn't have any problems with mosquitoes. On campus, we've got dozens of basins. We don't have problems with mosquitoes. And it's a mixture of, of a, a lot of things. We've established ecological functions so that I'm assuming, I haven't done any study on this, so, uh, but I've, from my own observations, we have hundreds of lizards and they just love eating up all the bugs. So I'm sure that has some type of insect control on our campus. 
but I'm not a, I, I'm not 100% certain. Um, but there are we when you establish ecological functions that are working appropriately, you're just going to get more and more benefits from it. Um, and then last thing, uh, when it comes to the water smart rebates, they're not fully established yet for the passive. Um, I don't know if and when they're going to be, but there's some talks about that. So when it comes to the water rebate program at the moment, they're not quite available. So if you do the active, you can get water rebates um, for, for active, but at the moment you can't quite get water rebates for passive. And then there are some phenomenal resources out there. This is on the city's website, low water use drought tolerant plants. If you wanna do a passive system or an active system, you don't need to do a whole lot of searching. Here's the list of the different plants that you can just plant in your backyard that work perfect for this area. Uh, another one is water guidelines for plants and lawn irrigation. Um, as it was mentioned in the active water smart, it's about 50 cents per gallon of active storage that you can get in water rebates. Here's a link for the actual uh, water rebates. And then again, Brad Lancaster, um, he's, he's a fort runner in Tucson on what it takes and how you successfully uh, implement all different levels of rainwater harvesting. So highly encourage you know, that plug in there. Um, there are many of your own community members that are already doing the forefront. They're already doing all the work. Manzanita Village has phenomenal active rainwater harvesting. Uh, even City of Prescott has done some amazing green infrastructure projects um, that optimize passive and active rainwater harvesting. The Senior Center, uh, again, the Adult Center that has active and passive. So there are plenty of examples as well in your own community to see uh, more on how to effectively implement these. Um, and I think that might do it. Uh, check it out. Check it out at the library. So there's even a hundred uh, thousand gallon cistern here, uh, which I'm sure is utilized for the landscaping. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. So I'm yes. to touch on the one upstairs really quick. We just revamped it. So it's been up there for a long time. Those of you who've lived here for a long time have probably seen it. We just revamped it and we put a system that goes underneath the sidewalk, underneath the courtyard, fence right there to a garden bed. And so the children's services librarian does a summer camp idea after school for them to grow things. And I heard, I haven't been up there today, but I heard the eggplants are doing very well right now. So if you have time after this, definitely go check it out because that's where you can see this in action. Um, I also want to touch on the rebates really quick. We are actually going to council next Tuesday to add the passive rainwater harvesting rebate to the rebate program. Woohoo! Yeah, <laughs> exciting! And that should be uh, in effect on July 1st. So it's actually, I didn't bring any rebate forms with me today because you should be seeing new rebate forms coming out very, very soon. And so I just wanted to touch on that. That rebate is going to be $5 per square foot of the drainage footprint of a passive system that you put into place. So, um, did you have anything else before we take questions? Um, there was, unless there's any other slides, then that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. <laughs> you mentioned Brad Livingston. Uh, there's a couple books that are available from the library, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. Yes, Brad Lancaster's um, volume one and two, phenomenal reads. They're pretty heavy too. They're like 600, uh, I mean, if you were to cut the pages in half and actually make it into a full-fledged regular sized book, probably be about four to 600 pages. Um, and he's gonna be coming out with volume three in 2020, I think. Oh no, revamped volume two in 2020 is coming out. Um, you mentioned pesticides, and I'm wondering, in our hilly, hilly terrain, and our houses are fairly close together in some of the developments, if you have passive, would, would there be a consequence your neighbor putting on Roundup and ending up in your yard? Very good question. I mean, your, your neighbor shouldn't be spraying Roundup other than on their own property. <laughs> I mean, they shouldn't be spraying Roundup anyway, but you know, on their own property. Um, it can run into your yard. Right? Yes. So most properties, uh, when they're first designed, they have some type of detention basin plant. 
And there is forethought on where that water is going. So I would dive into that first, see how yours might correlate with your neighbor, and then it might just have to be some conversations to have with them. Um, that, is, that is important to know. When you're building a passive rainwater harvesting system, the place you don't want to divert the water is into your neighbor's yard. That is that's something to avoid. You want to make sure that the drainage works well so that if it does overflow, the water has a place to go so that you're not just draining into your neighbor's lawn because that starts civil arguments, right? And so you want to make sure, and that's what we are going to have a passive rainwater harvesting guide that will be posted onto our website, and that will kind of give you the step-by-step -step and Nick actually told me this when I was walking around Prescott College with him, is that you watch the water when it rains, and then you watch it again, and then you watch it again, before you put in a system like this. <coughs> you want to make sure that you have a good idea of what your natural landscape is already doing before you install something like this. Yes, it takes time and observation. And in Brad Lancaster's books, that's the first and last bullet point that he has. Um, observe, observe, observe. Any other questions? Yes. Nick, I'm replacing my river rock coverage with the mulch. Um, prior to the mulching, I used a water permeable barrier, plastic barrier, for weed control. Um, when the tree guy came out, he said, well, <laughs> the rock will pull the heat. It gets so hot, it will pull the water out. It's hard on the roots. So take those out, put the mulch in. Do you leave the water permeable membrane or do you pull that as well? Once that membrane is, is laid down, it's highly tedious to remove. And what will happen, they only have about a three to five year time span before they start weathering away. Okay. Other roots and things get in there. So depending on how much there is, I might just leave it. Um, it wouldn't, the water's still gonna permeate through. It's not gonna affect um, too much. And what's the optimum minimal depth of the mulch in a passive system for root cover? So as, as much as possible, but also it's what you're looking for. Um, you, you probably don't want a three foot pile of, of wood sticks in, in, your, in your yard. Right. So ideally um, about, if you can do six inches, because when the rain comes, it is gonna kind of settle in itself. And then I know that at the dump it's free. Yes. Um, I try and go to the darkest of the mulch, indicating less pine. Friends have told me that because of the turpentine or the creosote in the pine, that it is a detriment. Is there any truth to all that? So uh, at the transfer station, there is a large pile of, of mulch that's available to, um, to all of us. You just pretty much need a trailer to, to go pick it up. And it's a mixture of everything. It, it can be a, a noxious weed, ba uh, weed um, bank, uh, weed seed bank. It can have different chemical properties to it, depending on what is put in there. Um, but as mulch, the more mulch you have, the better off you'll be because you're introducing more processes for chemical cycling. Once you get some levels of rhizomes, it'll break down and make very simple molecules that your plants can then utilize. So, can you commingle grass clippings with that mulch directly, or do you have to compost clippings? You can. Uh, grass has uh, levels of nutrients in it, grass clippings, but it's just a matter of how much you want, um, and it also depends on how you're treating your grass. Are you putting large amounts of phosphor phosphorus and nitrogen in order to keep a lush green grass? If you do, it might actually spike and it might burn some of the plants that you're planting that around. So you have to be careful with it. In uh, systems theory, both physical systems and social systems, there's nothing operates in isolation. In Colorado, and I have no idea the details of it, they outlaw, I think, certain areas, and I don't know what structure, what systems did it. But as citizens were harvesting groundwater, rainwater, I had heard in in, in newspaper that this was outlawed. I think that was since rescinded. Maybe can you shed any light or any rainwater on that? 
<laughs> yes, so I can do a little bit. Um, it's, it gets complicated and fuzzy because you're talking about paper water that's designed around why those laws are made. Um, in Arizona, it's legal to capture rainwater. Um, you just can't create, I believe you need some type of permit if you're going to bury your cistern of some sort. That's through the city. Yeah. Um, and water rights don't take effect until the water is channelized. So that's why in Arizona it is legal. I was born and raised in Colorado, and so when I moved here I thought it was weird that we could collect rainwater <laughs> because my whole life we were not allowed to do that. Um, and it's because Colorado is the headwater state. So every bit of water that is in Colorado is allocated to someone. And so the mindset behind those regulations was if we do mass rainwater harvesting in Colorado, what is it going to shortfall down the line? That being said, those regulations have since changed. So they do allow minimal rainwater harvesting. Now, if they were to put you know, some extravagant, gigantic thing, I'm sure someone would have something to say about it. But right now my dad is putting rainwater harvesting on his house, and so it is now legalized to do that. It was just a old regulation that it was not allowed, so. So in my case, if the time comes, but if nobody believes it will, that it may, uh, if I want to be self-sufficient on my property and I have five, 5,000 gallon tanks, I've calculated I can be with the proper engineering, I can be self-sufficient. Uh, is that legal? In Arizona, that is legal. Yes. As long as you've got the correct permits if you're in the city limits. I'm in the county. Okay. You might still want to check with them. So the, the biggest thing about permitting with the city, and we are actually adopting the 2018 building code right now, and I've spoken with the building department. We originally just permitted where the location of rainwater harvesting cisterns were in case they overflowed because we need to know, you know, if it's going to cause property damage. That is um, cumbersome to do and it costs money to get that kind of permit. And so now with the building official, we've decided that anything over a thousand gallons of storage needs to be permitted through the city. Anything under we're good to go because we don't mind if you have the 55 gallon drums that's not going to do much damage but when you start to get bigger and bigger you may need you know a concrete pad underneath it you may need certain other aspects of it and so the city wants to see that do you know if the county has the same sort of rules <clears throat> i haven't personally looked at the county i know the count i haven't heard anything specific by the county so i don't think they have any regulations but that would be something to call them about I just was going to point out that some homeowners associations have rules too. Like I live in Hidden Valley, there's some rules about it has to match your house or yeah. I know, so it's good to check with them. It is. Most HOAs have it in their CCNRs what is allowed and what is not allowed. Usually, if you can put it in your backyard and it's not viewable from the street, they've been relatively good about adopting it. There's only some HOAs that I know are outright no's. And I've been communicating with the HOAs pretty frequently on getting, you know, the educational aspect of this because a lot of people, when they don't necessarily understand the usefulness of something, they don't like them. They think they're ugly. But there are some very attractive uh, cisterns now. You could go to the big box stores. They look like clay pots, you know. And so there's very attractive options to do this. It's not just the big blue barrels or something anymore. You can paint barrels, uh, generally polyethylene, and I've done a little testing myself, and a little bit of prep helps. Uh, and I found the thing that helps the most is to flame them. You get a propane torch and just lightly tease the flame over the surface. It oxidizes the material on the surface, and then paint sticks better. You don't want to melt it, but just, just tease it. <laughs> 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 the city does not condone torching or rainwater harvesting. <laughs> but if that helps, I do have, I did have someone, another rebate customer, who was doing the some kind of primer as well, and it stayed up pretty well when he painted it. I've done it with latex house paint, no primer. And it worked? It's been a year, and it looks yeah. like the day I put it on. Perfect. So there is options out there if, you're, if you don't like the color of the big tank stores. I also put some uh, resources on the back table. So I have some local companies that maybe do this. Of course, the city does not endorse any of these companies. I just call different ones to see who does these kind of things. And then as we discussed, the rebate program should be revamping uh, July 1st. So you should see that stuff hit our website. You should start seeing it on Facebook. 
And that's when you can kind of start seeing if you want to do a passive system on your own property. Uh, I think we are going to close it up today. And if you have individual questions for different staff, of course, there's us. There's also Matt and Oren in the back, the environmental coordinator and the stormwater specialist, and then Leslie Grazer on that side, the water resource manager. So if you have any questions, please stop and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.